you can go into cold water and you can dip yourself there. You will have an increased focus, increased drive, which will give you motivation for the rest of the day. What is the best way to do it? What's the amount of time we should do it? What's the temperature we should do it at? And what's the difference between a cold shower versus a cold bath versus an ice bath versus a uh, cryotherapy you know, unit where you can go and stand there? Talk us through all that. Okay, so if you use the sea or the cold plunge, I mean, that this is where you can do the same thing, right? So um, when you do that, <laughs> you can... Um, I think it's really important that people do a little bit of breath work before they go into the water because they need to think about their uh, breathing and their nervous system as the steering for how well your cold plunge is going to be. And especially if you're new, this is definitely something you would <laughs> like to practice before you go into the cold water. Yeah, you don't yeah, go yeah. Ah, totally into yeah, panic. Yeah. Totally, so totally. if you can stand on the jetty or before your plunge and just do some uh, breathing with your nose, so nasal breathing in and out and try to relax if you're standing in a cold wind. It can be difficult, actually. And uh, by that, you will lower your stress response. So you activate your parasympathetic nervous system. And if you can do that, you, one, rehearse it before you go into the, the stressful situation uh, where we would like you to continue this. But also, you go into this stressful situation not already very alert. So that's not really going to help you. So when you have rehearsed this a bit and you can... It can take a few seconds and, and, and you don't have to stand there for very long. But when you can do that, if you have relaxed a bit, you exhale completely before you step in because that's going to make room in your lungs for doing the first like inhalation. And, and if you are new and I am especially concerned for the new ones, I don't, I want them to have a really good experience. <laughs> that's why yeah. I'm, I'm talking to those people. Yeah. And yeah. Saying, yeah. Um, so if you if you completely exhale, you make room in your lungs. More capacity is there, right, for you to do a, like a <gasps> inhale, and you would do that because you <laughs> you yeah, yeah exactly yeah. you activate your gasping reflex. So you cannot really help that. You cannot control it uh, at at when it happens at, at at the first time or the second time maybe. But what you can so if you do, scream when you jump in the cold water, that's okay. It's completely okay. It's completely okay. <laughs> I think people will forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. But what you can do is you can lower your stress yeah. when you go into the cold water and you gasp a bit. Just try and remember, just think about your breathing. So the goal is to do completely nasal breathing in and out when you're in the water mm. and also during your cold shock response. But this is not going to happen the first time. I'm just quickly going to say that. But you can try and rehearse it. So if you do a cycling, I, I just... I think it's 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 fine if people do the try to keep the inhalation through the nose and then out through the mouth. Yeah. So how many this. how many breaths should you take? Just cycling while you're in there. Just do it while you're in I, a cold plunge. I don't know. I haven't counted that. I just and try you, to and relax. You, you want to do it for like a minute or two before you jump in? Is that the idea? Oh, you mean on the jetty? I just think yeah. you should stand there for. A few, it could be a few seconds or half a minute. It's just until you feel that you have lowered your stress response, especially if you're a little bit anxious about this, try to calm yourself down. It's a, this is also a training for your anxiety, <laughs> right? It's yeah, like to, sure. to, to uh, open sure. your window for stress. So it also sure. starts before you yeah. go into the water. So yeah, yeah, yeah. lower so your stress before, response before you go into the water. But in the water, try and see if you can nasal breathe. But if you can, then just do the cycle uh, of in through the nose and out through the mouth, and then you can switch eventually when you get more adapted to this, but it doesn't have to be the first. So breathing before time. and then breathing when you're in there. Yeah. And then, exactly. and then how long do you stay in and what temperature? Oh, yeah. So that depends on where you are. So we in Denmark, in Scandinavia, we have the nature to completely control what temperature we have in the sea. And I think that's amazing because our the water temperature is always cold. <laughs> so so we go down to maybe one degree um, and that Celsius, could be Celsius. Celsius in January. But if, if we, for example, when we start, like we call it winter swimming or cold water swimming, we call that um, from October. And October is like, that is when the water, the water is gonna get colder, um, and that's around maybe. Ah, it it varies a bit, but maybe yeah, it could be fifteen on down to nine degrees, 
And mm-hmm. uh, then in November, so 15 degrees is Fahrenheit. Celsius, about 59 yeah. is 59 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Fahrenheit. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm I'm not good with the converting. That's <laughs> no, okay. That's okay. We got. I'm not sure everybody gets what this is. <laughs> There's listeners all over the world, so some are Fahrenheit, some are. are yeah, uh, exactly. Celsius. Yeah, I should memorize this. Actually, I will try. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. Um, so when you get into the water, it's not that important exactly what temperature it is, as long as it's just cold water. It, you'll be amazed that actually your metabolism is going to be activated also from 20 deg- degrees Celsius, actually. And, and you don't have to always have the water at one degree if you can control that in a plunge or something. You can vary the temperature. So... Just a difference. Well, you said down to nine. That nine is like 48 degrees, but a lot of these cold plunges go to 40 or something. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, it doesn't have to be that cold, right? To really to have the same benefit. So you don't have to like power down to like 40 degrees to get the benefit. Do you get (laughs) more, do you get more benefit if it's colder? So we haven't done any uh, studies. There are no studies showing the, the, the relationship of temperature and activation of the metabolism and what what will happen down the road if you have like more benefits or if it's going to stress your body too much we yeah. need these studies in the future but what i'm saying is that it for my study where we had winter swimmers in the ocean here where the temperature from october varied from i think there is like that there is a table in the book actually where I put it in so people can see what's the temperature in Denmark, what are we talking about? So it's and the very... book is winter swimming for those who yeah. want to get it. Winter yeah. swimming, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the book is winter swimming. It looks like this. It's actually like pretty amazing. I think amazing. So amazing. in the yeah, so in the book there's a table showing from October until the season ends in Denmark, which is in um, April. Uh, so during this time, the temperature is going to be from 15 or 9, or it varies a bit, and then down to 1 or 0 degrees Celsius, and then it goes up a bit again in February and also in, in March a bit. And then in May, it gets hotter, of course, the water. So, But it's not like it's that hot. I mean, 19 degrees Celsius in the summer, it could be it's a little so bit chilly. warmer. It's still chilly and it's going to yeah. activate your nervous system. It's going to activate uh, your metabolism. So enzyme. that's interesting. So, so then, you know, cold plunges are, you know, 40 degrees. You can down to 45. My bathtub, I, I, I measured the temperature in the winter in my bathtub. I just put cold water on and it's like 48. <laughs> it's like 48 degrees, which is like nine Celsius. And so okay. it's pretty cold. Um, it's pretty cold. Yeah. And, I, and, and so then you're, you're in there um, and you could do it. In a, in a, in a, you know, in the ocean, which is sort of more adventurous, you could do it in a lake, you can do it in a pond, you can do it in a river, or you can do it like in your bathtub in the winter if you in turn on the cold bathtub. water, right? Yeah. Just turn on the cold water. Uh, you can actually throw bags of ice in there if you want to make it even colder, right? <laughs> yes. And then, and then, or you can buy one of these fancy cold plunges. I have a friend of mine actually, you know, bought a horse, a horse trough. It's like where you feed horses water. And then you know, just, it's like a big metal tub you can buy like for a few bucks at the, horse supply store or something and then he fills it up with water and then throws a bunch of ice in there and it's Fantastic. like how he does it so oh, wow. there's a lot of ways to do it uh, how long should you stay in a minute two five ten minutes what what's the per what's session the... yeah so i can tell you what we show we found in my uh, studies um, that we performed here in denmark so in my research study from my phd we found that uh, that 11 minutes, and this was shown in winter swimmers who had already been swimming for a two to three winter swimming season. So they were adapted. I wanted to study the adapted ones because I wanted to see if that were different from a group of control subjects, right? And I wanted to monitor how much time do they spend in the water. And I wanted to find out with how little can we get away with because I was, I was not a winter swimmer myself. I was kind of like, like most comfortable people with temperature, I don't like the cold. So I was thinking, I'm I'm pretty much like m- many other people. So can we figure out something that is easy to do, but still efficient and f- efficient enough? So 11 minutes per week, we found and divided. Wait, well, not 11 minutes all at once, but just like 11 no. minutes per week. 11 minutes per week and yeah. not, in, not at once, divided on two to three days. And also per day, I, we did, at least in this study, they alternated with cold plunges and the sauna. So it was this contrast therapy where it started with a cold plunge and then they went into the sauna. 
and then the cold plunge again, sauna, and I ended in the cold because I told them that that is how the protocol should be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because that's yeah. good for you. I, I can tell you why, but yeah, it's yeah, definitely, I want to talk about that. Yeah, but just to you're talking, you're talking about like three to four minutes a day a time is what, when you three divide eleven by three or four right? per day, right? So every plunge should not be more than one to two minutes. This is what my my subject just one said. to two minutes, not not yeah. three or four minutes. At one to two minutes per dip. Oh, because I put my stopwatch on. I stay in three minutes or four minutes sometimes. Well, do you, do you also alternate with the sauna? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I cheat. I cheat. <laughs> no, no, you don't because my studies show that that's good. That's contrast therapy. So, so what you should do, you should plunge for one to two minutes and then you go into the sauna. And my protocol also shows that um, that our winter swimmers stayed in total for 57 minutes in the sauna so if you divide that also on these days, and if you have, of course, the facilities you can go and alternate, then you should only stay in the sauna for 10 to 15 minutes and then back in the water and you end on the cold. So basically for about an hour a week, you can have these dramatic health benefits. It's amazing. Right? It's yeah. dramatic. Now, what about a cold shower? Yeah, cold showers. Because you know, Wim Hof talks about like a two minute cold shower in the morning. Well, is that as good or what, what's the deal with that? And cold showers are definitely something that I would also say that if, if people cannot come to a cold plunge, then I think that a if you don't have a bathtub shower, or a cold, yeah. No, exactly. And not all people do. Then I think it's a very good alternative and people can start off in a cold shower, but there, there are different benefits. And uh, it, I, I think that if people can only do cold showers, then that is better than nothing. So I would say cold uh, showers are very good for you. It will also activate your brown fat. It will also activate your sympathetic nervous system. You will not have uh, the complete activation of your parasympathetic nervous system, and you will only get adapted to that temperature which you take your cold showers in, <laughs> of course. So there are studies on this showing actually that I was gonna say, if you live in Arizona and the cold water doesn't get under like 60 degrees, well then, but if you live in Massachusetts in the winter, it's like 40 degrees. So yes, yeah, you, yes, you know. <laughs> exactly. So it really depends on your, your cold water, how cold is it? So, um, and if you, uh, so there is this, this interesting study where they compared temperatures and of cold showers. If you can get adapted, the question was, can you get adapted to a cold water with cold showers? And they divided these uh, groups up in how long time they ended on cold showers in their hot showers. And there was also a group who just took hot showers. And they found that if you end on a few seconds, 10 seconds cold shower with a certain degree, it was 15 degrees and uh, the other group was um, 12 degrees. And they then took, put them into cold, um, um, cold plunges to see if those subjects who had taken cold showers at 15 degrees Celsius, if they had adapted to cold water just in general. So they tried that out in cold plunges at 10 degrees, but they hyperventilated just as much as the group who didn't take a cold uh, showers. So the temperature is going to depend, dictate whether you get a addicted. Not addicted. Adapted. Adapted. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm kind of addicted to cold and hot therapy. Actually. I think, I'm, I think yeah. I might be addicted. It's so yeah. addictive. It just makes you feel so good. It's like better than any drug I've ever found. Not that yeah. I take a lot of drugs, but it's like, it's pretty <laughs> impressive. Uh, the, the other thing is, is these cryotherapy units, you know, where you go in and you stand at like 270 degrees below zero. You put a little hat and mittens on and you sort of stand there for three minutes. Does that do the same thing? Um, yeah, so th there's a lot of like questions. I have a lot of questions around that and I have been through some of the literature. I can't say I've been through it all, but I've definitely been through a lot of it. And I can say that it seems like it can activate your uh, temperature receptors uh, in the skin. So you will have an activation in some degree to your brown fat at least. And if because the temperature is so low, you only spend, what, three minutes in there. Isn't that yeah. right? Like three, yeah, four yeah, minutes. Three minutes. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah three I think minutes. the yeah. protocols in, in the science literature is around the three, four minutes. Um, if that is going to have the same effects uh, like as submerging into water, 
I would doubt because the yeah. modality is so it's different. different. Yeah, it's so different. different. So that is also why if we cannot compare the cold showers with the cold dips, we can also not compare, uh, what do you call, you call it, jacuzzi Cryo. or hot tubs? Hot tub, yeah, with a sauna. Yeah, right? hot tubs with sauna because it's air and, and water, water, more molecules, of course, in the water closer to yeah. your skin. So yeah. it's, it's going to do different things so we need more mm. studies also on the cryo to exactly say how is that gonna um, lower your inflammation but i leave but i believe there is something there i just i just need some more backup from <laughs> from yeah, the yeah, data got it well <laughs> yeah. we're, we're we're gonna link to this study but in in uh, cell reports medicine you published in 2021 a, a paper called altered brown fat thermoregulation enhanced cold water or cold induced thermogenesis in young, healthy winter swimming men. And, and there you talk about like the sweet spot of the dose, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you talk about this sort of concept of, of why um, there's a minimum threshold effect um, for both cold and, and heat exposure. So can you talk about what those thresholds are and a little bit more about that, that study? Yeah. So, uh, so we already just touched upon the, the protocol for that. What actually was the results of that? That, that was um, the minimum threshold. It was, like, it was yeah. like 11 minutes and 57 minutes of hot and 11 minutes of cold. Okay. Yeah. That's what like I thought per, you were getting week. to. Per week. Per week. Exactly. Per yeah. week. Per week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and divided on multiple days. So I tend and, to do that in a day if I can. If I can, if I can go back and forth for like four times and then hot and cold and I can yeah. get that in a day. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that, it, I mean, it could be that we don't know what's the higher threshold because we don't have studies showing exactly on the cold water uh, if that's going to have some detrimental effects on our system down the road. But we do have, um, yeah, I don't know if we, we should go there right now, but it's like we have these sauna studies, observational studies, uh, where we can see a higher and a lower threshold for which it, a window for where it's definitely good for you. And that is why I think because of that, it's just stress, heat stress, cold stress. It's just stress for the body. We should keep ourselves, try to hit the sweet spot in the middle where it's healthy for ourselves and for our system, because you could be feeling really good when you get out of your cold plunge and some people can build up a long time, which I don't really recommend that people do, even though you can, you can mentally <laughs> feel, okay, I'm getting cooler and cooler. I mean, I mean, not only physically, but I'm getting really tough and cool because I can sit in this plunge for a very long time. Oh but my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, and maybe also some get a little bit competitive around it. Yeah. 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 I just want That's to, true. to underline that it might be that you cannot really see what's happening. It right now and you may feel really good afterwards but it doesn't mean that it's not overstressing your cells and maybe down the road it's it gets it adds up and gets too much we don't know that but we we need to figure that out and do more studies on it but i think it's very important yeah i agree i think it's going back and forth interesting but i i, I went to a conference up in the mountains in uh, in colorado and they had a, a, a sauna that was amazing a wood-fired sauna got super hot and then they had a cold plunge outside which was really cold and so we had a group of us all these overachievers and you know wow. <laughs> entrepreneurs. Oh, no. and, and so we were going back and forth and like increasing the time and time and i i got to five minutes in the cold which was pretty damn cold this one woman got to like i think 10 minutes it was just impressive it was very impressive she was like a navy seal you know like I think, oh okay yeah <laughs> no, she wasn't a navy seal but i was like being a navy seal <laughs> um so that's really amazing now uh, i want to now i want to go into the heat part uh so we did the cold we did a good job on the cold at a high level is it better you think to do hot and cold alternating therapies or like, is it good enough to do cold or just too hot? Or what What are the sort of advantages to doing both? I would say anything is good. So if you only have the ability, if you can only do the cold, then do that. If you can do the heat, then do that. Just do some of it if you cannot do both. But if you can do both, I would say it's a really good thing to try and contrast it. Um, I don't think that you will... You, I can't say what exactly effects you will miss out on because my study shows the combination. Yeah, exactly. But we know what happens in the cold and we know that there are um, 
it creates this hormetic stress and you increase these stress proteins and it repairs the cells, which also happens in the, in the heat. The mitochondria in the coat, in the coat will increase and in the heat, the heat will make, um, will make the mitochondria more uh, efficient. So there are all overlapping effects of doing the cold stress and the heat stress for your cells. And when I talk about cells, you should just think about your whole body because the whole body is like <laughs> building blocks of your, all your cells putting together. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's just not one cell I'm talking about. It's a whole organism. So it's good to do both uh, based on what your studies. Can you take us through the mechanisms of action of how heat stress uh, benefits the body? What are the, what are the mechanisms and how does it work? Mm. So when because you know just... in my book, you know, Young Forever, I talk about yeah. hormesis and and I talk about how you know in the in these Finnish studies you saw like a forty plus reduction percent in mortality in the group that did four to five saunas a week and the control group was like one sauna a week because uh, pretty much everybody in Finland has a sauna, so they all do saunas. So the control group was also doing saunas, but it was still a pretty dramatic reduction. So tell us about how does this work? What's the mechanism of action? What what are they doing to the body? Yeah, and I, I just want to say, I think these results are remarkable from uh, Finland and the, the study that you mentioned from 2015 is really showing um, what happens down the road. So this is like results after uh, following these sauna betas for 25 years. And the control group was actually also using the sauna. So one of the things that we in research sometimes debate a lot is that the control group is some completely other group who doesn't do anything healthy like the sauna bathers or the, the winter swimmers. But this group has actually chosen to also do this kind of healthy uh, thing. So even though they maybe not have the time to do uh, four to seven times a week or for, they for some other reason don't do that, but they still just do one time. And that's at least a choice in your life that you want to expose yourself to extreme temperatures. So I think it's a really, it's a good study. I, I, I really love it. <laughs> so tell us how, how to, just at a high level, how do cold and hot therapy have this massive potential to increase our health and our longevity even as a, as a kind of strategy for enhancing our well-being and our lifespan? Yeah, I love that question. It's a really good question. Taking it from the top, just actually, why should we actually do this? And why is it good for us? So overall said that um, I think that down the road, when I have read a lot of literature and also done my studies, I kind of realized that this is actually um, a, a good way to prevent lifestyle diseases. So it uh, protects the body from uh, getting in, uh, inflammatory, inflam it protects inflamed. the body. Inflamed. Thank you. <laughs> it protects from inflammation. That's right. I don't speak any Danish, so you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So inflammation will decrease when you stress the body, whether you stress it in a cold way with cold stress or with heat stress, you will lower the inflammation if you continue doing this. So from the first time that you go, you will already be starting this process because you are creating what you just mentioned before, the hormetic stress in the cells, which builds the cells stronger, but also the whole system is going to be activated, your immune system and more uh, white blood cells will come out in your system because of the shock and also the stress hormones and which uh, eventually also then because of the increase in metabolism, which I know we will get back to that. Yeah. What is that and how does that work? But all in all, this will lower your inflammation in the body and it will lower your stress level. So you will have a lower uh, blood pressure, you have a lower heart rate uh, and you have done this for a while. And that is actually what we measure as uh, an outcome for having a risk for uh, cardiovascular diseases and lifestyle diseases such as type 2 diabetes, but also inflammation is associated with uh, neurological diseases such as depression and Alzheimer's disease. So what I wanted to do in my studies and why I actually went back to university after working at the hospital, I was like, okay, so many sick people here and the pile is getting bigger. I wanted to go <laughs> around that pile and see if I could find out some way to give people some advice so this I don't know, this pile doesn't get bigger. I just wanted to figure out if I could give advice before they actually get sick so we could prevent disease and what keeps people healthy. So hormetic stress was 
actually what I went for. So yeah, the brown fat, which I know we will get into, but this can yeah. prevent lifestyle diseases and mental diseases. I mean, this is just remarkable what you're saying. Essentially, there's this simple, basically free, almost free therapy that has the potential to deal with inflammation in the body, which we now know is the biggest driver for almost all chronic diseases, not to mention autoimmunity, not to mention aging itself is an inflammatory disease. And so we have this incredible technology that's been around for thousands of years that we've been using to help our body stay healthy. And it's, I think of these as, as survival pathways. When you know we were in these non-perfectly thermoregulated environments when we were out there hunting and gathering and we didn't have 68 degree temperature controlled environments all the time. And we had to deal with these extreme temperatures of heat and cold. And, and when, when we had that, it seems to activate this ancient longevity pathway. And I think the inflammation story is so important. You mentioned mental health because it's not just increasing dopamine and other neurotransmitters. It's actually your brain is inflamed when you're depressed. And so exactly. this is actually an interesting doorway. And I, I just want to share a little anecdote. I'm going to get more in, yeah. uh, into the details. Yeah, I, I had chronic, chronic fatigue syndrome when I was in my 30s from mercury poisoning. And uh -huh. I was really sick. I was super inflamed. My gut was inflamed. My muscles were inflamed. I had myositis. I had uh, brain fog. I had constant aching and pain everywhere. Oh my God. And I was just this mess of inflammation. And the only, one of the only things that could actually help me get relief for a short period of time was doing a sauna and a cold plunge or doing, an, doing them over and over again. And it was like, it was kind of like a miracle drug that nothing else worked. It wouldn't, it wasn't curing me, but it literally helped me get some relief. So I, I know from firsthand experience, I mean, it's great to do when you feel healthy already and it just enhances your health. But even if you're sick, if you're already sick, like I was, it was such a powerful intervention. And it really is something I've used for decades to help me stay healthy, feel good, to reset my nervous system and to change my biology. So it's super powerful. I completely understand. I mean, did you did did you have pain relief also? Absolutely, pain relief, cognitive my brain fog lifted, my muscles stopped hurting. I, I sense, felt like a normal yeah. human being for a few hours afterwards. Wow. And then my you know, my mercury poisoning, I had to deal with the mercury, the cause of it all. But yeah, eventually yeah. <laughs> I you know, it was so powerful. Yeah. Now I, I kinda wanna get into the science of this. We're gonna get into hot and we're getting into cold, but we'll start with cold. You're you're really one of the leading researchers in this, if not the top researcher. So let's let's break down what happens in your body when you go into cold immersion and, and what are the effects on your biology? And we'll go through all of them, including physical and mental. Okay, so let's start with what happens when you go into the cold water. So as soon as actually you stand there on the jetty or on the beach or wherever you plunge in your cold plunge in your garden, as soon as you take off your robe, off your clothes, you will stand there in the cold wind and you will have an activation of your, starting your activation of your sympathetic nervous system, so your fight or flight system, because the cold receptors on your skin is going to send a signal to your brain in your temperature regulating sense in the hypothalamus, where there will be this center which always regulate and sense whether you are getting a little bit too hot or a little bit too cold. And from that, it would sense out, send out these signals, so stress, uh, neurotransmitters in the brain, but also hormones, which are noradrenaline and adrenaline, uh, cortisol, also a little bit, uh, not so much actually, but it's going to activate your stress syndrome system. So, um, and that's going to make your heart rate goes up a little bit, but also your blood pressure just a bit. It's not much. It's just between 11 to 19 uh, millimeter um, uh, mercury. Uh, mercury. Thank you. Um, and uh, which is not so much. And studies actually show that this only happens with the heart rate going up and also the blood pressure going up a little bit only happens if you are a new winter swimmer. And when I say winter swimmer, it's just because that is the term I use the most here in Denmark, <laughs> because that's what we call it. But what I really mean is cold water immersion. You could call it plunging. You could call it, it's just going into cold water and you can use the way you want to, what suits you in your life. But here in Denmark, we have the open sea, so we call it winter swimming. And that is why my book is called that. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, yeah. just to explain the terms. <laughs> so... Okay, so you have an activation of your sympathetic nervous system. When you're new, it's more, of course. And when you then I mean, when you into... when you first start when you first start practicing cold immersion therapy, you start having a, you have a more extreme reaction in yeah. your physiology. Yeah. Exactly. And 
that's of course going to activate when you then go into the water, that's going to activate full on your sympathetic nervous system. But because of the diving response, when you submerge your body into the cold water up to the neck, it's going to activate your diving response and your... Um, and what's that? Your, your diving response is because you submerge the body into cold water and that's going to activate your parasympathetic nervous system. So it's actually also your vagus nerve. So that's going to make your system go a little bit in, into a conflict. So the heart rate really wants to go up uh, because of the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. But the diving response, because of the activation of the, the digest and rest system, will make the heart rate and blood pressure go down. So there's a little bit of, of a stress in the body in the first um, yeah half a minute to a minute around that time. Um, especially if you are new to this. So if you are trained and you have done this for a while, your body gets more adapted to it and you won't have as much of an activation of the sympathetic nervous system as you would if you were completely new. So you'd have more of a parasympathetic response. Yeah. If you were doing it over a period of time, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you get adapted to this. And that's also because of some physiological processes that is happening in the body. And you can divide them into three processes, which is the metabolic process, where the activation of the brown fat in the body is um, this healthy kind of fat that we have. I'm not going to go completely into that right now because that's not... We're going to come back to brown fat. Yeah, we are. We are. But that's... It's a good kind of of fat. It's a good kind of fat. (laughs) The good fat. And then there's the bad fat. That is the white fat. And we want to activate the good fat so we can get rid of some of the white fat. So that's a good thing when you go into the cold water and you activate your sympathetic nervous system because that is going to increase more adrenaline, activate the brown fat, and then you heat up. We're going to go more into that. Okay. But that's one of the... Well, here's the... just Just to stop for a second. So just to yeah. unpack it because you're going fast. So the diving mm-hmm. response essentially is to sur- help you survive if you fall in cold water yeah. because it slows everything down and slows your metabolism down and slows your heart rate down. It, it's why people who have hypothermia, even when they seem to be near death, can be revived because they, they everything kind of is conserved. Yes. Right? So that's, that's actually a good thing. So it that, is that's, a good thing. Yeah. That's because of, it's cold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, it, but that, that's sort of what the diving response is for people yes. who don't know what that is. And, it, and it's... It's a powerful survival mechanism. It is exactly, yeah. So um, the diving response only activates when you submerge into water, so not in the cold shower, for example. Um, so when you do that, you have this activation of um, your all your neurotransmitters in the brain, and you will have this um, activation of the parasympathetic nervous system if you are able to stay there uh, longer than uh, the cold shock. Uh, and when that subsides, it takes about a minute or two, then you have the full activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. And if you can get over to that and you can sit long enough in the water for that, you have to rehearse that people should go very slow. And this is <laughs> not true. what you do. The, the, first, first, the first 30 seconds are the hardest <laughs> and then it gets yes. easier. <laughs> yes, then it gets easier. But it goes quick, actually. Studies show that only uh, al- already after... Uh, the third time, actually, you go into cold uh, water, and uh, this has been tested in in studies where they have they took subjects and put them into water, and already after the third time, they could see a lower um, hyperven- hyperventilation um, in the subjects. So they found that they didn't hyperventilate as much. So the heart uh, the heart rate and blood pressure uh, went down. But it's also because of yeah people get a little bit anxious about going into the water. What is this? Is it dangerous or is it? So, yeah. So the first uh, thing that happens is the activation of your autonomic nervous system. And then the metabolism, the brown fat is the next part, right? So then tell us about the brown fat, what it does, why we have it, why it's important. Because, you know, there's a, there's a fascinating, um, group of, 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 of Tibetan practices called TUMO. You probably know about this, right? TUMO, you know about the TUMO practices? Uh, the drying of the the drying of the sheets. So the Tibetan monks, when they would go through their initiation, who lived up high in the Himalayas, they would have these sheets dipped in ice water in the cold Himalayan winters, and they would be wrapped themselves in the ice sheets, and they would have to meditate and activate their brown fat. Of course, they didn't know they were doing that. They were doing ancient breathing and breath practices, activated their brown fat, and dried the sheets on their body. <laughs> and then once they got good at that, they were they were actually given the opportunity to go up into the snow basically with just underwear on and a loincloth and have to sit overnight and and keep themselves warm 
overnight in the winter. So that's the power we have within us that people don't realize. You didn't know about this? I don't. I didn't know that story. Actually. Oh but my it's God! It's good. amazing. Thank, it's thank amazing. You, for that. you should That's Google it. Dry, it's called yeah. drying of the sheets or tumo. It's an ancient Tibetan practice. It sounds like it's it's about the brown fat because it's not like you can say so intuitively. We have known about how the body works and how we can heat up from the inside. We just didn't have the science around it. If you look back to our um, ancient uh, Greeks, so Hippocrates and Socrates, they all they said that. They advised people to go into the cold water and go into the the, the hot water because that's gonna make your fluid your um your blood or your fluids uh, what is that called <laughs> yeah fluids your body fluids in the, yeah your body fluids flow easily in the body if you do that so they didn't really know exactly um they didn't have the science to back up what they were really saying but they kind of intuitively knew that this was already going on. So it sounds like this story you're telling is because people can feel that they heat up when they get cold. That is also what um, my science show that you actually get physically warmer from activating your brown fat and doing this kind of uh, activity going into the cold and going into the heat. But you get warmer. Yeah, it's true. It's, you know, Seneca, 2000 years ago, was a Stoic philosopher. <laughs> I was a cold water enthusiast. He he inaugurated the first of every year with a cold plunge in the Virgo aqueduct. And Thomas Jefferson used a cold foot bath every morning for 60 years and died at 83, which was old back then. So yeah. uh, it, it's fascinating that, yeah. that there's actually Hippocrates also talked about yeah. cold plungers. So this is not a exactly. new idea. Yeah. It's not a new idea. They call this thermalism. That's why I actually call my school or my 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 course. I call it thermalist and thermalism core a uh, cure because yeah, because I, that's a tribute to them because they already them saw this and today we have some science to back it up. But so so, so you have this parasympathetic sympathetic shift in your body, uh, and and that actually even though it seems like a stress, eventually it actually can help your nervous system calm way down, right? And, and, and mi mitigate the effects of stress. Um, I want to come into the brown fat, but I want to talk about this inflammation and also the mental health part, because I think that's important. Um, and, we'll, and we'll dive deep into the metabolism conversation. So, so with the cold plunge, you get uh, a release of other neurotransmitters and it changes your cognitive performance and your mental health. Uh, and, and, and can you talk about that? And then we're going to talk about inflammation, then we're going to talk about brown fat. <laughs> okay, great. So the mental health part. Um, yeah, so what what is great, or you can say what we actually need today is to learn how to stress up to stress down. And that is what happens when you go into the cold water. So what happens is you get this increase of neurotransmitters in the brain of uh, no adrenaline, which gives you focus and drive. And it actually increases up to 2.5 fold within just a few minutes. And I think that is amazing. And we knew this already back in the seventies, which is shown in studies, old physio physiology studies back then. So it's not kind of like new news or anything. It's just that today we can, we can take the science together and, and we can make a better picture around what actually is going on in the body when we put this together. And um, also together with, with uh, my research, which uh, I published a year ago. But what it shows is that you will have this increase in noradrenaline and you will have a more focus, you will have more drive because you also increase dopamine and dopamine also mm. increases 2.5 full above baseline. Wow, amazing. Yeah, it's, it's like amazing. Taking, it's like taking a riddle in, basically. <laughs> Right? It is, it is. yeah. Wow. Uh, and <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what, you don't take Ritalin? <laughs> no, exactly. I'm like, I'm saying yes. Uh, and people are being like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. From an academic perspective, it's like it's the same mechanism as we Ritalin. Have or cocaine. <laughs> or cocaine, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I have also. And it's much safer for you. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's much it's safer. safer. For you. Yeah. So I think it's amazing that you can go into something this simple, cold water, and you can dip yourself there. You have an increased focus, increased drive, which will give you motivation for the rest of the day to pursue whatever you want to do. And you get a more positive uh, angle to your life even because you also increase oxytocin, which is also a stress hormone. It's also the what we call the love hormone, um, but it increases your way of viewing your life also. So it, this is the gratitude that you can 
feel when you go into the cold war. I don't know if you feel that, but but yes. definitely this is what I hear. So well, I'm definitely uh, grateful when I get out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but but all together, when you go into the cold water, what it does for you collectively, it opens it widens your window for stress actually so that is a process when you go into the cold water and you can relax in a situation which is super stressful for you and you can use this and practice in the i call it a cold water training center for your nervous system because this is really where you can try and uh, open up this window a bit more so you don't get as easily stressed in your everyday life. I'm not saying that we are not overstressed, but maybe we are, our window for stress well, has also are. narrowed. <laughs> it has narrowed also. So yeah. maybe if we can open that window and we can tolerate be- stress a bit better mentally, then we would also not have our as much a mouth breathing society, which we have today. And when you breathe through your mouth, you activate your sympathetic nervous system, right? And that's going to also affect your mental health. So it's like you're stressing yourself. It becomes this vicious cycle. Yeah. So yeah. you can use the cold for your, to, you could say, create a better mental balance for yourself, not only just in the moment, because in the moment you will completely forget about your worries because the body goes into a moment of just survival. Even though you did it on purpose, the body's going to react that way, but you can use it. You can use that reaction to complete delete what's at whatever was on your plate. <laughs> and oh, it's a great worry. reset. It's an incredible reset. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. I call it the control alt delete effect um, because that's exactly <laughs> what it does. <laughs> oh my God. That is so good. Control alt delete. So you yeah. can control alt delete all of your stress response and come into a calmer nervous system state that allows you to be more focused, present, happier, increases all the happy mood chemicals, love chemicals. I mean, it's really quite remarkable. And it's uh, it's something that happens pretty quickly. It happens so rapidly, within a few minutes, actually. So, so if you can stay in the water floor, just getting over to the other side, I call it of the cold shop, where you stop hyperventilating and you can relax in the water. You don't really have to stay there much longer you have already the benefits, right? So you can go up and what happened there is you completely deleted your worries and you then have a new, you can say mindset, your your brain is full of all these good chemicals and that is going to make you view your problems, your life, everything, nature, people around you in another perspective because now you have this positive sin, uh, positive mind, right? Um, and that's how you go into life. So if you can do this a couple of times a week, imagine how that's going to affect your life. If you yeah. on purpose can go out and take this happiness pill, it's just cold water. Well, it's like it's stress resilience, right? It's like yeah. think about, you know, if you if you had to never exercise and you're a couch potato and had to go hike 10 miles, <laughs> It would be a really hard thing to do. And if you oh, yeah. if you are are constantly in a state of stress that is psychological stress, but you don't have a way to reset your nervous system and become adapted to it, you don't develop stress resilience, right? You can develop exercise resilience where you can be fit and exercise. It doesn't bother you. Whereas if you don't have that, it's going to bother you. The same thing with what you're talking about. It's a way of building stress resilience in our life so we can handle more stresses over time and not be so buffeted around by all the difficult things in our in our life. Yeah, exactly. And I think yeah. one like thing that we can, we can like point to, which it's very difficult to like prove how did, how do you get more stress resilient with this? But I think one thing we can point to as a, as a kind of proof to this is that we have found in my studies that you actually get warmer from going into the cold water. So becoming a winter swimmer, a cold plunger, dipper, whatever we call it, um, you become a warmer person, meaning that you will be more comfortable in the cold. And I, as myself, can completely uh, vouch for that because I was definitely a person who was a bit of a, I call myself a cold sissy back then. Um, but today <laughs> I am not. Today I'm like, I'm completely like, I would say most like, I'm, I don't, fancy the cold and I don't think everybody anybody should actually that would be really weird but I like the cold today because I know what it can do for me and a cold wind today doesn't bother me as much as it did 
when I wasn't yeah, into swimming. So my, my stress resilience against uh, temperature changes mm. has actually changed. So it doesn't bother me as much anymore. So I think that is one thing that we can point out and say, well, that's just a physical thing. So imagine yeah. what, what is actually also happening in your mind. Yeah. So, and also, you know, what's interesting is a lot of mental health problems mm. are problems of inflammation in the brain. So depression is inflammation of the brain. You touched on it earlier. Uh, ADD is inflammation. Autism is inflammation. Alzheimer's is inflammation in the brain, right? So a lot of the things that, that are going on in the brain mood-wise are inflammation, as well as sort of all the other chronic diseases. So can you talk about the role of cold therapy for inflammation? in general and what it does and what the mechanisms of action are and how it works. Mm. So now we want to talk about the brown fat because <laughs> that is what we activate when we go into the cold water. So the brown fat, I'm just going to repeat a bit because yeah, I didn't really say it all. Yeah. So when you go into the cold water, as I told you, you activate the cold receptors in the skin and that's going to send a signal to the brain and that's going to release noradrenaline, which is a stress hormone. And that's going to activate our healthy brown fat. And that's located, you can almost touch it actually, it's underneath your clavicular bones. And I measured it in my studies, it's just at like one to two millimeters under your skin, so you can almost touch it actually. Um, yeah, exactly. And that's the largest depot. There are six places in the body where this, uh, where this it's actually an organ, it's, 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 you can define it as an organ. It's six places, but it's around the central nervous system. And it makes sense. We have as it's around your back that, too, right? And then your yeah. between your shoulder blades and your back. Yeah, and so down the spine and uh, under your superclavicular bones, on your what is this bone called? The sternum. The sternum. The sternum, sternum yeah. bone. Yeah, exactly. Um, and also a little bit around the kidneys and a little bit around the heart, which makes sense. So yeah. the purpose of the brown fat is to keep you warm, and this is of course developed during evolution and to keep the human body warm when we were out there and it was super cold and then it was super hot some other times but back then we had the brown fat to keep us in the perfect uh, regulation all the time and that takes energy so the brown fat when that is activated it increases our heat in our body um, but that takes um, energy so that uses glucose and fat from the bloodstream as fuel to activate it and increase our what's called thermogenesis but it's yeah. also what's called non-shivering thermogenesis meaning yeah. that the muscles are not helping at this point so, so what thermoge actually... thermogenesis just means heating up the body so you can heat up it's by shaking and shivering heated. or by the activation of this brown fat that's been there for millions of years <laughs> yes exactly thank you so it's like the first responder to our body when we get too cold or we get too hot but it happens so quick. We have like 10 times more uh, cold receptors in the skin than we have for heat, for example. And that is because we can easily die when we fall into cold water. It makes sense that the, that we have been involved in that way. That was before so climate change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And today we, we, we don't get exposed to any temperature changes, right? So it's like living these houses 24 degrees all the time, right? So. The brown fat is going to also be activated directly from the skin. So, so there are studies showing, um, recent studies actually, in, in showing that there are signals going directly from our skin and directly to the brown fat without go passing the brain. So there's like two pathways to activate the brown fat oh, immediately wow. within seconds, uh, as, as soon as you get a little bit cold on your skin. So also when you just go out in a t-shirt and it's, it's cold. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So that increases your metabolism. That increases your metabolism and actually makes you burn more fat in general. Like fat. you said, the brown fat activation helps burn the white fat, which is what we're trying to get rid of. Yes. And also it, it burns your glucose, so your sugar and fat in the bloodstream. <clears throat> so does, it doesn't only take the fat um, that is like on your thighs and on your belly and you want to get rid of the white fat, right? But it clears up also the glucose and fat that is uh, already floating in your in your uh, blood vessels, so in your bloodstreams. Yeah. So it's gonna clean up that. 
and it's going to use from your depots as well. If you are cold enough, or you can say for long enough, and you do, for example, uh, multiple uh, plunges, or you also use the sauna, the sauna can mm. do some of these things too. <laughs> we yep. need to remember that. We're going we're gonna to get we're gonna get you there. We're going to get yeah, you yeah. there. Exactly. So, but so, yeah, that is that is like the first thing that happens with the so, metabolism. So essentially what you're saying is that it helps to regulate one of the biggest problems we're facing in society today, which is insulin resistance, which is problems with our blood sugar and metabolism. I mean, 93.2% of Americans are in poor metabolic health, which means they're somewhere in the continuum to diabetes. And what you're saying is that this cold therapy can be an adjunct to lifestyle treatments that actually help to improve your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your fat burning, your metabolism. It's just fascinating to me, right? Yeah, exactly. That is that is what happens down the road when you continue this. And yeah, so it actually happens from your first plunge. So it's, it's going to do all this acutely, but eventually... Is, is there data that... that, that, that sorry to interrupt, but is, is there data okay. that show that... You, you can lose weight by doing cold plunges? No, not on the weight scale, at least. But we can see in my studies, um, which we published from Copenhagen University in 2021, that we can increase a, the brown fat activity and make the brown fat cells more efficient. Because what happens in the brown fat when you continuously... Um, expose yourself to the cold is that it increases mitochondria in the cells and the mitochondria are the little energy fabrics that you need you would like more of of course because that's going to keep you young and keep the cells young and it's going to help the brown fat cell uh, increase more heat in your body and that's going to burn more calories from your body as well so the more brown mitochondria you can build in your brown fat cells the more efficient they will be and the more fat and sugar that will burn and that's going to decrease your um and increase your insulin sensitivity which we also found in my studies so so basically you know even though we haven't done the weight loss studies theoretically it seems like it actually is increasing your metabolism which will help you to lose weight and correct the insulin resistance which will help you even lose weight even more so it's sort of an incredible positive feedback loop in terms of uh, energy in terms of mood, in terms of mitochondria, in terms of metabolism, in terms of inflammation. What, what's the mechanism for reducing inflammation? Because I noticed that if I have pain or stiff or sore, I go into a cold plunge, I come out, it's just gone. It's quite amazing. It's like taking it's like taking a bottle full of Advil or something, you know? Yeah, it's amazing. And actually, it's it's kind of like really hard to get down to and find in literature the precise um, pathway for this and what's actually going on. But what I have found so far is that you, of course, you activate also the, the IL-6. So it's like um, what you also do when you exercise, for example. But um, and that is uh, like um, and uh, um, it's inflammatory uh, cytokine. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and it's also going to uh, activate um, IL-10. So it's going to do both, of course, but because they're both... an anti-inflammatory cytokine. Exactly. Yeah. And because of that, you are going to lower your inflammation. And when you lower your inflammation and you at the same time increase um, uh, endorphins in your body, you will have a lower uh, pain in your joints or whatever. It could be in your leg or where you have your pain. Um, but it's also because of the more blood circulation that comes to this place where you where, where it hurts and in time when you continue your co plunging you will have a um can you say clean up i don't know but it's yeah. and it, because of the the increase of of leukocytes and monocytes which is going to clean up the inflammation they will the come out sense. and like ex exactly and that's going to take that away from your bigger blood, uh, blood circulation but uh, in the capillaries there you will have more and more blood circulation and a better vascularity, and that's going to relieve the pain also. So I think there is more processes going on here, which are a little bit dif difficult to like come down to and say exactly what is going on. I think there is multiple things going on, but some of them could be this. So just basically three things. One is it seems to increase endorphins, which is like morphine or heroin, the pain relief yeah. chemicals you have in your the, body. Yeah, It, it increases... The activity of a important cytokine. Cytokines are these inflammatory or immune molecules, and one of them is called IL-10 that reduces inflammation. 
Uh, and three, it increases initially vasoconstriction, which it sort of shuts off blood flow, but then it actually, the rebound effect, the rebound effect is you get vasodilation and then you get increased circulation. So there may be like multiple mechanisms to reduce pain. Multiple mechanisms. But we could also just mention um, uh, nitric oxide, I think, because ah, nitric yes. oxide, yeah, I think it's an important one because when you go into the cold, that happens also in the heat. So <laughs> we could back, go back to that. I keep saying that. <laughs> you know, we're, um, gonna get, we're gonna get hot in the suit. <laughs> <laughs> but the nitric oxide is gonna give the, it's gonna increase the, the the blood vessels ability to dilate and contract. So, um, and that's going to increase the oxygen delivery to all your cells also in your body. And that is also a good thing for pain relief. Yeah. So nitric oxide is basically, or NO, uh, we did a podcast with Louis Ignara, who is the one who won the Nobel prize for discovering this molecule wow. of nitric oxide. Yeah. And he, he can go back and listen to that. And it's so important. I will. I will. It can be uh, so effective for many things. He was even talking about it as a treatment for COVID because of the powerful anti-inflammatory effects. And so this is something our body makes to breath. If we breathe through our nose, it's really important to breathe through our nose. If we breathe through our mouth, we don't make nitric oxide. But you're saying is that, that this cold therapy also will activate nitric oxide, which is a powerful anti-inflammatory compound in our body. It's so important. It's so cool. All right, all right. So now we've talked about all the benefits. Um, the brain benefits and mood benefits, the dopamine chemicals, the stress resilience, the increase in our metabolism, the decrease in inflammation, in pain, all these wonderful things. Now let's talk about how do we take this drug? Because <laughs> it sounds like a miracle <laughs> drug, right? Uh, so, so tell us about the mechanism of action. How does the heat stress work to activate longevity switches in the body and healing yeah. responses? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I can... I can uh... I can explain all of the things that's going on because I also know from the literature that there are still things that we don't know. But what we do yeah, know yeah, for is sure. that, what we that, know? <laughs> that we, when we activate our heat uh, um, um, receptors in our skin, there is like the cold receptors, there will be sent a signal to the, to the hypothalamus and we will have an increase in noradrenaline and we will also have an increase uh, of yeah all our stress uh, response of course nitric oxide will also be released and there will be an um, increase of, uh, of uh, or the blood vessels would dilate because you need to get rid of your heat in your body the brown fat will also be activated it seems that there are actually studies showing that the brown fat which is increasing our metabolism is also activated in the heat. And oh, it's kind of like contraintuitive. I know that. Yeah, but right. It's kind of like I have, I have tried this in India um, or in Sri Lanka, actually. Um, so when you get really, really hot and you're too hot, then you are given a tea <laughs> to drink some tea. And that's like, why are you giving me something really hot when I am too hot already? But that is like, that is to drink that get warmer in your core. And when you do that, you will help your blood vessel to open and that makes your body body's ability to sweat even better. So that is what the brown fat also does to your body. It activates. So you will open your blood vessel, you get you can get rid of the heat. But the heat stress response is, um, or the best response from that is actually an increase in uh, sweating and your... Um, ability to sweat, but also an, a lower core temperature. So for every time you go and expose your heat, uh, you activate your heat stress response in your body, you will um, prepare your body for the next time. And by that, the body is uh, sensing, okay, I will have to prepare myself. So your core temperature actually by time lowers a bit. And you can use that for something. Um, and I don't know if you want to know that. But yeah, um, of course. Now yeah. what? <laughs> use it for what? <laughs> yeah. So I, I love I love that people are like, what could we use, use a lower core temperature for? When I'm also like, well, actually, when you lower your core temperature, you have a higher window for, for example, when you go and train in the training center, when you do your sport. Uh, because what happens is, what is lowering your running economy is actually that your temperature goes up. So if you want to have a, a higher a, 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 um, training economy or, or um, you can train for a longer time before you get exhausted, before you hyperventilate and you have to stop, that is your temperature going up. So if you can widen that window a bit, then you, you are actually getting fitter. So Oh, wow. So it makes yeah. you fitter. 
It, actually, yeah. I think the science it, there it, it increases, increases your cardiovascular the, fitness. It is cardiovascular fitness, and this is also shown in studies that because of the dilation and the contraction of the cells of the the blood vessels, but also uh, because of the sweating that increases uh, your ability to sweat, that is gonna uh, for your blood vessels, your blood, your whole circulation is like um, a, a training. It's like um, training out, or, or it's like a moderate. Hit training, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So it's, it's like exercising by sitting in a sauna. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Essentially. Yeah. And what is interesting, it has really great cardiovascular benefits. Like, tell us yes. about the cardiovascular benefits of sauna. Yeah, so um, so going back to the, to the studies that we just talked about before, um, the observational studies from Finland, which shows that if you go into the sauna two to three times per week, um, it will lower your risk of cardiovascular disease by 27%. Um, and if you, yeah, and if you go into the sauna, um, four to seven times per week, which is almost like one time every day, then you can lower your risk uh, of uh, cardiovascular diseases by 50%. So I think that there's a lot of, um, health benefits, which we can see here on the, in this study on a long term, which is them. And now we'll go back to that because of lower inflammation, because the heat stress is going to activate your system, your blood vessel will dilate and you will have an increased ability to um, also um, contract and, and dilate your, your blood vessels, but also you will have, uh, what, what was it I wanted to say? Sorry. <laughs> I well, well, I mean, I, th I think, you know, just to kind of like talk about the cardiovascular fitness benefits in yes. terms of blood pressure, heart rate, yes, heart rate exactly. variability, autonomic nervous yeah. system health, stress resilience, uh, Reduction in uh, you know congestive heart failure sort of complications. I mean, it's really quite interesting to see the data on this, right? Yeah, exactly. So the cardiovascular health increases because you also you, it's like a cardiovascular fitness you do when you go into the heat. So your blood pressure will actually be lowered. These there are studies showing that the blood pressure goes down when you exercise your your system in the heat, and also your heart rate and your heart rate variability. So. There are really signs now today backing up that the heat stress is a workout for your body. Yeah. So just to unpack it a little bit for people. So, so heart rate variability is a metric that is measuring the complexity of your heart rate. The more complex it is, the healthier you are. And, and it's a great sign of your stress response, your autonomic nervous system. And it's sort of a great measurement that we can use. And we can do it through our aura ring, Apple Watch, all kinds of Garmin, Fitbit. We we'll all measure this heart rate variability, which is really an important thing to track because it's it's really the sign of your overall health. And it, it correlates with mortality and many other things. And so what we see with sauna is it actually increases the complexity and, and increases the heart rate variability, which is really an important uh, effect of the saunas and the heat therapy. Um, there, there's another thing that happens. Uh, it has to do with heat shock proteins. Are you familiar with the heat shock proteins? Can you talk about what are heat shock proteins why they matter and, and what they do uh, and, and why it's so important for us to, to activate these heat shock proteins in our body. Mm. So heat shock proteins increase when you go into the heat and the body sends that now you're getting warm. So the heat shock proteins are in all your cells and you can increase that uh, when we uh, get uh, warm or the cells get warm. And that is to protect the cells. So the heat shock proteins increase and they repair the cells from the inside. Meaning that if it, you don't overdo it, the heat shock proteins is going to repair the cells so they will live longer. So that's good for longevity. So if your cells live longer, you will also live longer, right? So um, the heat shock proteins, uh, are there are many of those. There is especially um, one family of those. It's called heat shock protein 70, which is the most studied, uh, I have found, uh, to show that when you activate that with heat, then this group of heat shock proteins is going to repair the cells. There is also the FOXO3, which uh, I don't know if I pronounced that right, but FOXO3. FOXO3. Uh, it's a mitochondrial yeah. regulator, right? That relates to longevity. Yes, exactly. And that is also increasing in the heat. So, and that's going to help you, your cells also be repaired and it's going to live longer. And as long as you don't overdo it, that's back to the hormetic stress, the healthy stress that 
if you overdo it, then then that would just exhaust. Yeah, I mean, if you, you'll get heat shock and you die, or you go cold, too cold, you get hypothermia and you die, right? So it's, it's that Goldilocks amount, right? What you're talking about? Yeah, I, I think the stress will will have the overstressing will help uh, start before you die. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so this is amazing. So the heat shock protein is important. Also, they help with protein repair, don't they? A lot of yes. proteins yeah, are exactly. damaged, and then one of the hallmarks of aging. That we talk about, uh, and one of the like I explain in my book, the hallmarks of aging is uh, is damage to proteins, and uh, and those damaged proteins don't work properly. And proteins are like the messenger systems in our body; they do so much and build tissue or repair organs, and but they're also communication systems. And so a, a lot of the communications get screwed up, and we have an information problem, almost like uh, you know bad software <laughs> is running <laughs> yeah. our biology. And so these sauna therapy seems to improve the these proteins and improve, fix them and repair them. Is that yeah. accurate? Yeah, exactly. The heat shock proteins repair the proteins in the cells, which is like a little magic uh, a doctor in our cells that you can just call with just going into the heat. And I think it's very simple and you don't have to be really good at it or anything. You don't have to be anyone special. You just go into the heat and then you could just repair yourself just for a bit, just a little bit of dose of repairing myself. And then you can go home. You don't have to overdo it even. Yeah, and it's anti-inflammatory also, as you mentioned, and, and the FOXO is involved in regulating inflammation in the body, so it helps with that. But also, it seems to activate the innate immune system, right? Our, our immune system gets boosted which, yeah. when, when we do this hot therapy. Mm. Yeah, it seems also to be activated. So so what, what, what amount of saunas do we need? You mentioned 57 minutes a week. I mean, is that, is that a reasonable amount? You know, like, that's like, like four 15-minute sessions a week? Yeah, so it's... I think if we, I try to compare this actually with the, with the Finnish sauna studies, just to see if it's comparable in what we can maybe call a good window for stress. So if we do the 57 minutes over a week, divided on two to three days and with two sessions each day, that means you could do four sessions each week or you could do six sessions each week. So it's between 10 and 15 minutes each session then okay hope you follow <laughs> yeah, but, yeah 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 see I, I try to get so hot that i can't stand it and then i go on and get so cold that i can't stand it and then i just get out so it's like i go back and forth but you're saying yeah. you don't even need to do it that extreme just a little bit even yeah. makes a big difference exactly i can so, come with a good example uh, after this i can i can tell you how little you can do actually um, so that's from, not so scary from... then for people it's like you don't have to no. be the ice no. man and be like Wim no. Hof in the ice no. bucket for like two hours and get no. the benefit, right? No, <laughs> you could be completely normal, scared of the cold and hate the heat and just say to yourself, well, I'm not really loving running 10 kilometers either. That's not really something I personally love to do, but I do it and I go up and train. I like that now, but in the beginning, I didn't, didn't like it. Yeah. yeah. No. And everybody who takes a break from exercise don't love the first run for five kilometers and they will hurt in your muscles. And that is just exactly when you do the hormetic stress by going into the cold and to the heat. But back to the, the, the 57 minutes. So you can divide that out. And if we compare it with the Finnish sauna studies, it seems that there is a higher and a lower threshold as well, where we see that if you do a more than 19 minutes up to 30 minutes, so 19 to 30 minutes, it seems also to have, right, I will start another place. So I'll say from zero minutes and up to, yeah, to 19 minutes, you will have an increase in, uh, or you have a, a risk, a lower risk, sorry, a lower risk of cardiovascular diseases. Mm -hmm. And that window will continue up to 30 minutes, but it won't like be better or anything. Your risk will be, get better. So, but after 30 minutes, there seems to be a plateau where, yeah, exactly, where um, the benefits don't, uh, are not shown anymore. And maybe even the risk of cardiovascular diseases increases. So it seems that under 30 minutes is like the healthy. And if you can stop at 19 minutes, that is where you get the, the most out of it. So my protocol shows 10 to 15 minutes even gives you benefits. So that is like in between. So that's why I call it a bit. Maybe it's the sweet spot. I don't know. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Well, I also, I also emphasize it's important for people to stay hydrated. 
So make sure they drink plenty of water. And also I recommend electrolytes because you lose a lot of electrolytes. And people will often be able to tolerate more heat if they stay hydrated and have electrolytes. So that's a little, little tip. Um, so in terms of tech, technology, I mean, there's infrared saunas, there's you know regular heat saunas, there's hot baths, there's sauna blankets. Uh, are they all the same? What's your better? It doesn't make a difference. Do you have any data? Um, Do we not know? <laughs> you know? There's, there's, yeah, I mean, there are not too many. I, I don't want to offend anyone, but it's like <laughs> there are not there are not very good studies on on this yet. Um, but there are some studies, and it shows that you can go into you can use the infrared sauna, and it's gonna. The most studies are on like um, on skin, on eczema, and if it if it has a difference in eczema patients in children and also in adults, and it seems actually to increase the moist of the skin, uh, and if you don't overdo it, you won't get burned. <laughs> That was also one of the for results infrared, from, for infrared. For yeah. infrared, yeah, you can yeah. burn yourself actually from that. But there are, I think it's a difficult thing to 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 go into infrared sauna uh, research because there are different lengths um, of Wave the lengths. sauna exactly, and there are the the short, the mid, and the the long uh, length of. Uh, of um, wavelengths so it's it's very difficult to compare also these studies so mm. some saunas have um, only the long <laughs> wavelengths mm. and some have the near combined with i mean it's yeah, it's, different it's ones, a yeah. little bit difficult to go into that um, mm. and i so we need more we need more data but the, but, it, but, it's, more, but they work and they and, work and, and they work and and what about like a hot bath because many people don't own a sauna yeah. What about a hot bath? Does that work? Yeah. Hot baths are very good, actually, it seems. So there are more studies on this. Um, and I can just give an example. Um, and so it I should be wanted... as hot as you can handle it? Or should no. it matter? <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it shouldn't be. Um, so there are studies in where they have um, tested type 2 diabetic uh, patients and um, looked at uh, glucose levels uh where they have been in a hot bath, they used the hot bath for um, three weeks, and they saw that the type two diabetic uh, patients who was in the study, they actually lowered their uh, HbA1c uh, level, wow. which is uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, I it's think blood that sugar, is yeah. it shows the the amount of how much um, sugar over a period of time they have in the blood, and there are also studies showing that it, that is like just an the temperature was 39 to 40 degrees Celsius. What Which is that like in a, Fahrenheit? Like 100. Like 100. <laughs> like like 100. Okay. 90 is to 100, yeah. Okay, so that you can use that, right? Yeah, but, it, but baths can be effective, but they're, they're different than saunas, and we don't know if they activate all the same pathways, or do they? Uh, not the same, but, but it's also the diving response because you also go into the, the hot water, right? But it seems that it also uh, activates uh, the brown fat, and it, uh, but that is not tested. Uh, like my study, exactly where they have measured what happens if they're hot bath. But you activate your metabolism as well, and you must do that because they also lower their blood pressure, heart rate, and also um, the blood sugar. But the other study about the pain showed that you can have a pain relief if you go into a hot bath at twenty degrees Celsius which is like on the middle side, not too cold, but not too hot, but it's like, yeah. And also another study showed like 25 to 27 degrees also had pain relief effects. So you can have many, many different temperatures doing all this. So I just think that it, it also shows that you should vary the temperature and even the temperature just being different from your skin it's going to activate. It makes a difference. System. So, so yeah. basically, you don't have to live by the North Sea in the winter to to do this, right? You can use a cold shower and a hot bath, and most people have access to that. You can do cold showers. You can alternate back and forth. You can do them independently, right? This is all stuff that we most people have access to. But it, but do you think it's worth the investment to buy some type of sauna, a sauna blanket, a small sauna for your house, or a cold yeah. plunge? Yeah, I think so. If you if you if, you are a person if we look at all the things we spend our money on for our health, yeah. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's a gift that keeps on giving. I put a yeah. steam shower 
in my bathroom. Really? Fantastic. Like 23 years ago. And oh, wow. I, I, it's still working. I've had to replace the glass a little bit <laughs> around the shower. Yeah. But basically, it's it's the gift that keeps on giving. And I just um, have a big bathtub and I fill it with cold water. I don't oh, have a cold wow. plunge yet. But it's it's something I've been doing for so long. And I find it one of the most powerful health enhancing technologies out there. And it's it's basically very inexpensive or or can be close to free. It can be. It can be almost free, but actually I think people should start thinking about this like for example exercising and going to the gym or buying your exercise equipment. Yeah. Yeah. You have to exercise your nervous system also. And you ah. have to buy some equipment for this because this is training your physiology but also your your mental health. So this is This is doing a lot more, I think. Of course, the exercise is actually doing some of the same things, but yeah. here you can do it really rapidly and you can mix this, but you have to invest in it and you have to, people just have to get used to the thought of like exercising your nervous system, I think. Well, this is so exciting because, you know, there's all these people talking about biohacking this and biohacking that, but you're a PhD research scientist and you spent your career focusing on the biology of hot and cold stress and how that can activate our body's own innate healing systems and even activate our longevity pathways, which I think is just phenomenal. If you love that last video, you're gonna love the next one. Check it out here. If we completely eliminated heart disease and cancer from the face of the earth, that we would maybe extend life by three to five years, <laughs> which is insane. When you think about it, these are the two biggest killers on the planet, why wouldn't we then live to be 120? It's because we're not a 